Welcome to I Love News Tips and Advice from Christy Love. In this episode of our series, How to Write a Screenplay That Rocks, I'm going to teach all you new and dedicated screenwriters out there how to structure a fantastic story outline that will make your script the best it can possibly be. So grab a pen and paper and write this down. Step one, you write your four act story outline. Step two, you write, you write your 12 chapter plot point outline. And step three, you write your three act per chapter outline. Now, this is going to take a bit of work, concentration, and focus, but it's worth it if you want to write a good screenplay that people actually want to read and produce, whether it's a screenplay or a manuscript or anything that involves a story, telling a story. I've been told by quite a few critics of my scripts that I'm actually a great screenwriter and readers have actually asked me what my screenwriting secrets are, so here I am unleashing a few of my helpful secrets for your career's consumption. Now, I know and you know that a good screenplay doesn't mean Hollywood will pick it up. I mean, you can look at what's out there right now and see that, you know, it's been a decade or so, and mostly what you see out there is just a crap fest of recycled nothingness mixed in with a few awesome superhero movies, but for the most part, everything they spit out of the big studio factory in Cali seems to be either a sequel to an already established, usually successful franchise, or it's a remake of a successful film, or it's based on a successful book, TV show, or video game with a big following and established built-in audience already. But... That doesn't mean that you should give up or compromise the integrity of your work just to get your foot in the door, unless it's a small compromise that doesn't ruin the quality or the direction of your project. So here we go. This one of the best. Uh, this is one of the best ways to write a screenplay that rocks. Okay. Step one, you write your four act story outline. Now I know they say it's a three act structure, and you can still call it that if you add act two and act three together and title act four your act three. I just call it you know, a four-act structure because it's more detailed and specific and true to the nature of the pacing of the script. Because realistically, you're in a new element about every 30 minutes or every quarter of your script. Every three chapters is a new season, a new section, and a new direction for your story. And in the four-act structure context, Act 2 and Act 3 are not the same in nature. I guess if you looked at it elementally, uh, I like to look at things like that, it would be like calling Act 1 fire, Act 2 earth, Act 3 air, and Act 4 water. That's the type of different elemental modes each quarter of the story takes you in. You start with the fire of action, you transition into the earth of substance, you morph into the air of progress, and then you conclude with the water of peace. I call my four-act structure... 2P2C or PPCC, that just stands for Act 1 is the problem, Act 2 is the plan, Act 3 is the chaos, and Act 4 is the cure. So problem, plan, chaos, cure, PPCC or 2P2C. Okay, very easy to remember. So the first 25% of your story, you need to focus on executing the main problem for your protagonist. The second 25% of your story, you need to focus on executing the main plan to fix that problem for your protagonist. The third 25% of your story, you need to focus on executing the main chaos that will completely screw up your plan to fix that problem for your protagonist. You're, you're throwing lots of stones at your protagonist. Then the fourth 25% of your story, you need to focus on executing the main cure that will fix the chaos that completely screwed up your plan to fix that problem, thus solving the problem for your protagonist. I look at every screenplay or manuscript like a football game or a pirate ship um, because it's a, basically a tug-of-war battle between your hero and all of his or her or their antagonists and obstacles, both outside and within himself or herself or their selves, obviously. So in the first 25% of the story, where you introduce the fire of the story, the bad team scores big in the game, with the problem. Actually, the bad team is on a roll, throwing the good team overboard, assuming they'll just drown in the ocean. But in the second 25% of the story, where you introduce the earth of the story, the good team scores okay in the game, with the plan. Because the bad team underestimated the good team's either survival skills or luck. But the good team, you know, actually, if it's a comedy, you want it to be luck. That, that's the reason why they kind of succeed, mostly. Um, survival skills is more for, like, more, more serious type of movies. But um, the good team is only just barely surviving at this point, keeping their head above water, whether they know it or not. You know, if it's a comedy, you know, they can just be, you know, happy and dumb. <laughs> and it's funny, like Dumb and Dumber or something. But anyway, so in the third 25% of the story, where you introduce the air of the story, the bad team scores huge in the game with the chaos. Okay, bring in the chaos. Because this is when the bad team finally realizes that they underestimated the good team because the good team survived their destruction. So the bad team, whoever it may be, they throw one final big blow to the good team to destroy them, and this major blow causes the good team to fall apart and finally starts to drown. They finally start to drown in the water. 
But in the fourth 25% of the story, where you introduce the water of the story, the good team wins the game with the cure. Because the good team finds the answers and resources they need to finally defeat the cocky, arrogant bad team. So the good team actually gets back onto the ship and throws the bad team overboard, conquering the enemy and winning, because most of us, we all like happy endings. And I don't understand people who don't. But <laughs> not all stories can have a completely happy ending. But, you know, that's what we like because we, we all need to be cheered up. So we can go more into detail on it in another video. But for now, that's the synopsis for your 4X structure in your story out outline. Problem, plan, chaos, cure. One, two, three, four. Okay? Problem, plan, chaos, cure. So now we're going to skip over to our next action step, step two. two. You write uh, your 12-chapter plot point outline at this point. To help you better execute this, you must understand that every 10 minutes, which is about every 10 pages or, you know, of your 120-page, 120-minute script, I, you know, most of the time that's what it is, that is considered the next chapter of your story. And each 25% quarter of your story holds three of those chapters in your story. Let me explain. In, for example, in the first quarter of your story that I call the problem of fire, your, your three chapters are, one, the catalyst, two, the main story, and three, the big event, okay? In the second quarter of your story that I call the plan of Earth, your three chapters are four, the decision, five, the character growth, and six, the point of no return. In the third quarter of your story that I call the chaos of air, your three chapters are seven, higher stakes, eight, crisis begins, and nine, all is lost. In the fourth and final quarter of your story that I call The Cure of Water, your three chapters are 10, The Resolution Begins, 11, The Showdown, and 12, The Afterword. So all together, when you write down your 12-chapter outline, it should read something like this. You can get your pen and paper out. I'll give you a little bit of time. A little bit of money. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. One, The Catalyst. Two, The Main Story. Three, The Big Event. Four, the decision. Five, the character growth. Six, the point of no return. Seven, the higher stakes. Eight, the crisis begins. Nine, the all is lost. Ten, the resolution begins. Eleven, the showdown. And twelve, the afterward. That is what you, how your twelve act or twelve chapter plot point outline should read. Every chapter pushes the story forward into the next chapter. To quickly sum it up for this episode in example form, because people we all learn best by examples, using our pirate ship storyline, here we go. This is just an example, okay? Act 1, the problem of fire. Okay, here we go. Number 1, the catalyst, which is the compelling action that sparks the fire of conflict in the story, in your story. This is when the good guys find hidden treasure and the bad guys find out about it. It's just an example. Two, the main story, which is the knee-jerk reaction to that compelling action that raises the fiery spark of conflict in your story even higher. That's when the good guys plan to take the hidden treasure they found to a dying orphanage of needy, hungry, desperate kids as the bad guys pretend to be friends with the good guys to find out where the new treasure is being kept. For example. Okay, three, the big event, which is the first major explosion in the story that erupts like a volcano taking the knee-jerk reaction to the original fiery spark of conflict in your story to its highest immediate culmination. That's when the good guys get robbed by the bad guys, and the bad guys throw the good guys overboard in the ocean at the sake of the orphanage. This is kind of uh, like the hook. The big event, I would say, is sort of like the, the hook you would you would promote uh, as the main, you mean, the main issue or main conflict of your uh you know, movie or book, basically. This is, the big event is the hook that, you know, gets people curious to know what's going to happen next. Now we're on to Act 2, the plan of Earth. Okay, that is number 4, the decision, which is the first step of the second quarter of your story when the hero consciously makes a choice of what direction to go in order to survive or otherwise respond to the conflict or surprise that was thrown into his lap in the big event. That's when the leader of the good guys, our hero, because you always need to have at least one major character that we all can follow, will call him Barack, for example. He really starts to begin his retransformation into a true leader, now taking charge, saving people who can't swim, suggesting to everyone a plan to safely get them all to a nearby island he knows about, while avoiding or defeating the sharks circling them nearby, for example. Note, the best writing, and I need to stress this because 
this is just very important. The best writing doesn't make all the other characters stupid, weak, or bad just to make your hero, the hero, look smart, strong, and good. All characters should be strong, many should be smart, and your hero is the best or should be the best unless he's like a controversial anti-hero, okay? He should always be the goodest, quote-unquote, character of all so we can actually care about him or her and admire the hero, okay? Just, just know that when selling your hero, it's not about dissing or putting down or making all the other characters around that hero look bad. We want to have respect and, and, and some kind of favor for all your characters. It's just that your hero is the best one of those characters. Even people, even characters that you don't like. You don't want people to just hate them. You want them to love to hate them. You know what I'm saying? So there's got to be something um, likable and uh, hopefully relatable, but at least likable about all your characters. And they have to be respectable. You can't just make them keep making stupid choices and then expect people to be like, okay, I so like this person. No, people are going to be like, okay, this person keeps making stupid decisions. I hate them. <laughs> Why well, wish they would die? That's what people say when they're watching movies. Don't, don't be that script. Don't be that script, okay? Just, if you don't know what I'm talking about, watch almost any recent horror movie or sci-fi movie on Sci-Fi Channel. Not not regular sci-fi movies, just Sci-Fi Channel movies because, Lord, they need some help. Okay, so then number five, the character growth, which is when the hero begins to consciously transform into his most heroic self and when the protagonists all learn more backstory about hmm, what the is going on and what they'll really be up against with regard to the antagonists. That's when, for example, the hero, Barack, learns something both internal about himself and external about the bad guys or storyline, like how to get back on the ship, take back their treasure, and get it to the kids in time before the orphanage shuts down, for example. Like, maybe, for example, our hero learns that the bad guys don't just plan to keep stealing treasure that's not theirs, but they also plan to rob, rape, and rope the nearest local little town of Pleasantville under their domination and murderous brutality and abuse. <gasps> Big deal now, because that, that raises the stakes a little bit, because the bad guys secretly have an alliance with the, corporate, the corrupt politicians and police under the dirty governor's rule in that town, and now our hero has to convince our nervous, worried, unprepared good guys team to become warriors and fight the bad guys to protect both the orphanage and the town that the orphanage is in, for example. Now we're going to six, after we've got that knowledge dropped like a bomb. You go on to number six, the point of no return, which is the final chapter in the second quarter of substance for your story, when you actually force your hero to make a powerful move that he can't take back, one that will abruptly lurch the story into a tornado of chaos in the seventh chapter. That's when Barack, the hero, makes a choice that changes things in a permanent way that he can't change or erase. For example, let's say our hero decided to stop playing defense and now begin playing offense. So he decides to go to war with the bad guys. So maybe he goes to the enemy of his enemy and makes a deal with them to team up with his good guys to help them take down the bad guys, assuming that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. That's kind of a point of no return because once you once you kind of spread out and make an alliance like that, usually you can't take that back. Usually that's going to cause some kind of Ways going to create some type of future action that you can't take back, usually. So then we're moving on. We don't know what, what what's going to happen from it. We just know this is new. So you always want to keep it new. Okay? Act three, the chaos of air. Seven, the higher stakes. Okay? Which is the first chapter of the third quarter of your story when, they, when the chaos begins. Okay? This is usually when your hero's actions start to make waves with the bad guys and awaken the sleeping enemy or draw attention to the antagonist or when somebody on their team becomes a traitor or gets kidnapped by the bad guys and tortured into spilling some secrets. Okay? This is just an example. This is when the seed of division grows and the good team slowly begins to fall apart. The beginning of the end. Okay? For example, just example, maybe the enemy of their enemy doesn't gel well with our hero's team. And the fighting that ensues as a result of the culture clash between the two groups maybe rubs one really insecure, greedy, dumb, angry team member the wrong way. So that little Judas brute goes to the bad guys and seeks power with them in exchange for his betrayal of the good team. Uh-oh. It's just got real. <laughs> Okay, then we move on to eight. The crisis begins, which is when the cyclone of chaos increases in intensity and starts to make things spin more out of control for our hero. And you start to see the tornado just, it's slowly starting to rev up. You see how this is, this is like air? It's just, everything starts to like a cyclone, like a twister, like, woo, it's all in the, you know, it's all a big mess. It's happening now. That's when, for example, the bad guys use the betrayer character 
you know, Judas, Brutus, whatever, to spy on the good guys and plant seeds in the team to divide the group and bait our hero, Barack, or his love interest, into a trap that everybody's too busy fighting around to notice. The betrayer succeeds as the team falls apart and the trap is set. Okay? So, Crisis Begins is kind of like when the trap is set. When, if there is a trap to be set. That's when you set it. I mean, that's when the bad guys... We see the bad guy set it, typically speaking. I mean, you can always change this. It's just that this is like, I would say, the, the, the basic way you should this, should... this should be your rule, and anything else you do should be an exception to that rule, because this rule works. It's good. Okay? Nine, the all is lost, which is when the twister of chaos spins around to its highest, fastest speed of random, windy destruction, and every bad thing you can possibly imagine happens, and it looks like our hero has lost everything in a big, big way. That's when, for example, thanks to the betrayer, the bad guys ambush the good guys, kidnap, torture, and kill some of the good team members, and whatever tools they used, you know, the good team had used or needed to fight, uh, you know, and, and defeat the bad team with, the bad team has stolen from them. So anything that they've gained in this whole movie so far, or book so far, gets taken away from them, and the all is lost. <laughs> and it looks bad. The bad guys have even, let's say, this, this, is what, this, this is how bad it can get. The bad guys have even, for example, framed our hero for horrible atrocities and murders that our hero, Barack, did not commit. So that the local township people in land, uh, in the land, uh, in the little town, in the quaint little town of Pleasantville, will not only execute our hero, but they will ruin his reputation and execute him for crimes he tried to stop, punishing him for killing people he tried to save. Maybe the corrupt, or the un corrupt mayor who was our hero's friend for example you know that would just be just horrible right well this is when you bring in all the horrible stuff this despicable twisting um of both truth and hardship will make the political irony of our hero's torture so much more angering and frustrating and engaging but at painfully realistic and outrageous that you know your audience reading or watching the story will be so pissed off at the antagonist and feel so upset and sorry for your hero that they won't know what to do with themselves they will be that emotionally engaged at this point especially if they know what it feels like to be persecuted or assume guilty for crimes they were innocent of themselves thanks to the tricky devilish world of human politics in our society so when you bring in you know that kind of thing it really kind of just kind of really gets people you know and then they start to really feel feel things for you and for your you know for your character so and they want to you know maybe even watch the movie or read the book again it's repeatability baby maybe our hero's voice has even been suppressed by a poison that will mute him so he can't speak defend himself tell his side of the story and warn everybody about the bad guys that are coming to rob rape and rope the town under their domination and murderous brutality and abuse at this point it all looks pretty bad but then we enter into the final quarter of the story act four thank god for act four right the cure of water ten the resolution begins, which is the first chapter in the last quarter of your story's conclusion when some type of luck kicks in for your hero, or he figures something out that breaks the case and gets him off the hook and gives him one last chance to fight and defeat the bad guys and protect the good guys who are also on the chopping block. That's one, for example, just another example again, the team that our hero Barack built up comes to our hero's rescue, and those who survived the bad guy's ambush in the last chapter team up together to break our hero out of jail and revive his hope for victory and his faith in humanity. This is when our hero gets to reap goodness from the goodness that his leadership and goodness towards others sowed. So even though he's not breaking himself out of wrongful imprisonment, the team that he created in The Point of No Return, which is like his baby, they are, this is, which is even better than him breaking himself out because it shows you know growth and it shows uh, le his leadership power and the loyalty and great positive transformation of those whose lives he's touched so they break him out of prison and take him in and plus it makes us all feel better because he's been pretty you know battered and bruised and abused and 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 wronged and lied on and and prejudicedly hated for you know for so long now you know it's just and he doesn't deserve it. he's such a good person it's gonna make people feel it's a good heart heartwarming moment you know it's a touching moment so and you know he could even have a little tear come down his eye you don't want to make him like too too emotional unless like it's a comedy but you know you want to show a little something a little something so some emotion at this point is what you want to show that he's like you know kind of like wow these people really they you know they're coming together and they're and they're, and they're coming to help me out you know like that's like you want it to really move the people watching you want them to feel what your hero is feeling so they break him out of prison and take him to a secret hideout where they nurse our beaten, tortured hero back to health. Then they discuss all the game plan ideas they can come up with to defeat the bad guys. But none of their plans work out upon, you know, vetting through by the whole group. But then, 
Then our betrayer suddenly comes back to the fold and shows up, saying he can get them into the bad guy's dark kingdom and help them take down the bad guys from the inside out. Now, uh, of course, after all the damage his betrayal did and, and people that he actually got, you know, killed and hurt, everyone just wants to kill this guy, right? And they don't trust him as far as they can throw him. And by the way, he should be, uh, if, the, if your hero is a guy, then the betrayer should be a guy, and the villain should be a guy. If your hero is a girl, then the betrayer should be a girl, and the villain should be a girl. Just generally speaking. You could always change it up, but you kind of want, you want to, you want your, your hero, villain, and, uh, and the wayward one to be the same gender because they kind of encompass the, the great, the, the height, the, the height and the depths, the greatness and the, 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 the best and the worst of humanity kind of in, in one, you know, it's just psychology thing. Just it's a better idea to do that. But anyway, as I was saying, so everybody kind of wants to kill this guy because of all the damage that his betrayal did. Everyone just wants to kill him, and they don't trust him as far as they can throw him, of course. But our unconscious uh, hero Barack suddenly appears at the opposite end of the room, maybe, and stops them from murdering their former teammate as he staggers weakly into the arms of his caring team. For example, our hero states a plan, maybe, that will require our betrayer to put himself at risk, willing to sacrifice himself, putting all responsibility on him while protecting what's left of their merged good team. Begrudgingly, everybody will agree because he's the boss <laughs> but the hero's best friend lets the betrayer know let's for example and you know on a side note to express what people are feeling that in his opinion nothing he does will make things right between them no matter how bad our betrayer feels about what he did this is to kind of express how you know the the audience is probably going to be feeling at this point you know some of the audience is going to be on feeling what the hero is saying and rise above it but most most of us aren't going to be that risey above yet e we're going to be like okay i don't give what he said <laughs> this isn't over <laughs> so you want to stick that in there too you don't want it to be all angelic and and and, and pretend like people aren't going to have dark feelings at all because that's not realistic so you want to keep you want to keep it realistic while still trying to inspire everybody to rise to their higher angels so 11 the showdown which is when the epic battle smackdown between the good guys and the bad guys takes place is this is when we see the good guys and the betrayer put their final game plan into execution mode baby and it works and our betrayer takes a bullet for our hero as the showdown intensifies until finally it's time for our hero to go one-on-one -on -one with his main arch nemesis villain in an epic face-off with the alpha dog leader of the bad guys this is the fight that determines the fate of their war at least for this episode, at least for this movie or book or whatever. During their battle royale, our hero gets our villain to confess everything he did, including working with the corrupt governor to frame our hero and their plans to destroy the city. And finally, when it's time for the final shot and our villain looks like he's about to get the better of our hero, the townspeople step in with all their ammo and order these bad guys and all the corrupt police and politicians plotting against their town to walk the plank in the ocean because they heard everything and they're taking back their town. Yeah, rah, rah, feel good moment for everybody. That's right, you do have power over your your life that's pretty much what you're telling the audience and that makes everybody feel good all the time so bad guys lose good guys win game over <laughs> 12 the afterward the orphanage is saved and the town elects our hero Barack its new leader more than likely either mayor or governor or something and he gets the girl you know, whatever girl he's been pursuing or, or having a crush on the whole time. And the betrayer, um, if you decide to keep the betrayer alive to represent mankind's redemption and forgiveness, um, then he can be a cemetery groundskeeper or something whose job is cleaning up bird and horse crap, maybe, as his consequence for his betrayal. And maybe he's got a bum arm or lost an ear during his defense of our hero or something in the showdown that, you know, when he got shot. And uh, that he, you know, he helped the good guys win in the end. So, you, you know, you could, you could do it, go either way. Or you could just kill him out of the story. If you want during the showdown, if you want to go the route of revenge, crime, and punishment without redemption, I would say that depends on how entertaining and sympathetic you write this character to be. If he's really unlikable, everyone's going to want to see him die. Okay? Um, if he's likable but deeply flawed, everyone's going to want to see him live. So if he lives, you're going to have to make him cry or, you know, something to make people like him. If he dies, you know, you know, cry over his crimes, should I say. If he dies, you might want to make him a really insensitive douche. Totally up to you, though. Totally up to you. So that's the general example and description of the 12 chapter story outline. And in step three, you write your three act per chapter outline. I hope I can say this quickly because we're running out of time. All that means is that you structure each chapter of your 12 chapter outline to the three act structure of one beginning, two middle, three end. That's it. 
So the first three pages of each chapter represent the beginning of your story arc for that chapter. The next four pages of each chapter represent the middle of your story arc for that chapter. And the last three pages of, your, of each chapter represent the end of your story arc for that chapter. I'll just give you one example because we do not have time to go over all 12 examples for all 12 chapters. So in chapter one of our pirate story, which is the catalyst chapter, we'll say that, for example, act one, the first three pages, um, is the problem for the chapter one. Act two, the next four pages, is the plan for chapter one. And act three, the last three pages is the chaos for chapter one. You don't need to have a section. You don't. You're not obligated to have a, a full out section for the act four uh, of the cure in each chapter because the cure ends the conflict, which ends your story. And you, you know you need your conflict, so you don't want to cure your conflict too early. And the co conflict in your story doesn't end until the final chapter. So, for our pirate story, an example of this three act per chapter breakdown in chapter one could be. Chapter 1's Act 1. Our hero's drunken ship captain takes the ship off course into uncharted territory. Chapter 1's Act 2 could be our hero takes over the reins to navigate the ship back on track to their land in land uh, to their inland destination of the town of Pleasantville to bring their minimal treasure findings to the orphanage in their homeland. Chapter 1's Act 3 could be that our hero notices the hint of giant monsters lurking beneath the seas. So he warns everyone to prepare to fight and when the monsters attack our hero's fight plan works. They defeat the sea monsters and when he cuts off the head and belly of the king sea monster millions of gold coins and treasure that the sea monster swallowed over the years of eating of eating ships and pirates all burst out of the sea monster's belly filling the ship with gold the pirate ship of bad guys that sat by watching the whole thing from afar assuming our hero and his friends would be all die at the hands of the sea monster they see this treasure from their ship spying on them with their eyeglass telescope you know that thing that they had back then and suddenly they want to be friends with our good guys because they want that treasure i could go on but that would take forever and hopefully you get the idea because we're running out of time for this episode if you'd like more specific help with a certain section of your script, writing, and storytelling project, send me a video response or comment. Or if you have any advice or feedback about how these tips helped you out, please feel free to send me a video response or wall comment for that. I look forward to helping you and hearing from you more, and um, hope you enjoyed. Thanks! Mwah. <laughs>